I think we can get started. So wel welcome to the first open lecture of the semester. I am very pleased and honored to introduce to you Professor Mark Feldman from Stanford University. Uh, Professor Feldman has uh, obtained his PhD in mathematics in 1969 uh, um, from Stanford under the, the supervision of a renowned mathematician, Sam Carlin. And since 1971, uh, Professor Feldman has been on the faculty in the Department of Biological Sciences, at, uh, also at Stanford. So the title of his PhD thesis was Some Topics in Popula Theoretical Population Genetics. And following that general theme, I think one could try to summarize his subse subsequent career as many topics in population genetics. Indeed, he has published over 500 articles in the field and has trained numerous, numerous students and postdocs, many of whom have moved on to become leaders in the field themselves. And in recognition of his important contributions, he has received many awards and honors, uh, too many to list now, but maybe just to name a few. Uh, they include Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, Dan David Prize, elected memberships in uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Sciences, and American Philosophical Society. Among the many things that he has done, uh, Professor Thalman is well known for originating the mathematical theory of cultural evolution. And today he will tell us about next generation cultural evolution, cultural niche construction, and multidimensionality. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yun. And thank you to the uh, Simons uh, Institute for uh, their uh, foresight in uh, developing this uh, interdisciplinary program this year. Uh, it uh, looks very exciting. Uh, I was supposed to be here last week, but I got caught up with one of the viruses that's going around and couldn't make it for the week. But um, I'm looking forward to interacting with all of the different people from computer science and physics and biology that uh, are inhabiting um, the Simons Institute. Um, not knowing uh, to whom I would be speaking today, um, I tried to think of different uh, problems that uh, somebody who's interested in genetics might think about from the point of view of somebody who's interested in the evolution of culture. Um, and uh, as the subject has matured since uh, Cavalli, Sforza, and I uh, first began this work in the early 70s, um, there hasn't been a great deal of work to make it as complex as the changes have happened in genetics. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, the last few years uh, has occupied my group has been to try to see whether we can uh, address some of the criticisms that anthropologists originally made of the theory that we developed, that it didn't take enough of culture into account, and in fact that you couldn't take culture into account and make it into something you could study quantitatively. Um, so I, I hope that we're, uh, try, we're gradually making progress in extending its complexity and its dimensionality and also incorporating some of the ideas that my colleague Kevin Leyland, John Audling smee and I developed in our work on niche construction, which I'll explain as we go along. So... Um, I don't think Darwin was a great fan of cultural evolution. In fact, he said that uh, he hasn't met any evidence in support of the transmission of superstitious customs or senseless habits, which today we would regard as quite erroneous, that there seems to be all around us plenty of evidence to that effect. Um, on the other hand, if you ask for the definition of the process of adaptation you get to quite conflicting views about it 
Uh, one of them is the one which is mostly accepted by ecologists, that uh, organisms uh, try and solve problems that are posed by the environment. And uh, on the other hand, uh, Lewinton uh, doesn't buy that. And he invented the term construction by saying that they don't adapt to their environments, they construct them out of bits and pieces of the external world. And that was what actually led uh, my colleagues and I to use the term niche construction when we began this subject in the early 90s. And in fact, we defined it with a rather complex definition, um, but the idea of it was that some organisms actively or inactively change the environment that other organisms operate in, even organisms of their own species, to the extent that they can change the selective forces that act on those organisms in their own or other species. And the result of that is a change in the formalism that you would put into a population genetics model that would be describing the evolution of organisms subject to niche construction. And in fact, what we showed in our original work uh, in the book, you can see some of the examples, uh, is that the dynamics become extremely complicated and you can have cycling and all sorts of things that are more commonly associated with uh, theoretical ecology than with uh, theoretical population genetics. Um, my postdoc, Yasuo Ihara, who's now a uh, professor at uh, Tokyo University, uh, had the idea that if you could think of organisms altering the environments of other organisms that they're in contact with or that are going to be there after the former organisms have departed, we could think of the same thing in anthropological terms by thinking of cultural traits that influenced the evolution of other cultural traits or other biological traits and in that way you could address what uh, anthropologists and uh, some psychologists call context dependence and the cultural context in which uh, the evolution of some cultural phenomena occurs could be very important in changing the way the evolution proceeds. And I've got um, an example that shows how this might happen. Uh, it's a very, I think, a very strange example of this kind, but there's no doubt that it fits that kind of definition. And it concerns data that uh, my colleague Melissa Brown and I worked on from Taiwan. Uh, the advantage of the data are, is that the Japanese uh, occupiers of Taiwan from 1895 to 1945 were absolutely meticulous in the demography of uh, Taiwan. So every birth, death, marriage, every uh, bit of income that came in, who lived in which household is documented in excruciating detail. Uh, whether the people were Aborigine, uh, and there were uh, two large groups of Aboriginal people in Taiwan, or Chinese uh, mainlanders, uh, the mainlanders that we today associated with the term mostly came after 49, but there were a group of people who came much earlier. Uh, these people, the Hakka, are generally well known, primarily because of their restaurants in famous cities, but the Hoklo people were also there and they came hundreds of years ago. But the indigenous people, the Aborigines, uh, there were two main groups, the mountains and the plains groups, and the plains groups were involved in farming. The mountain groups were not. Um, but uh, those people uh, genetically are much more closely related to Melanesian than they are to East Asians. Uh, and many of the customs they have, uh, for example, uh, tattooing, moustaches, 
on the women. It's a custom that you see in many parts of uh, Melanesia and even among the Ainu in Japan, presumably to make the women uh, less attractive to invading uh, marauders. Now, the Han people from the very beginning bound the feet of the women uh, and as girls, and you can see how excruciating that must have been. Um, there are museums in China where they, uh, you can see these shoes, which are this big, where they've tied uh, the feet of the girls. So the girls could not move out of the household. And one of the um, reasons may be uh, another study that is, Melissa is working on with uh, other people has to do with their value as weavers and spinners of uh, textiles, that uh, they did this from the home, never having left the home during their whole life. But in 1915, the Japanese outlawed foot binding. And uh, the things that happen can be picked up in the census data, in the uh, demographic data, um, almost immediately. And what you see is not only a change in religious and burial practices, but a big change in marriage practices. So what happened to the marriage customs were the Han people regarded the aboriginals as barbarians because they did not bind the feet of the women. And that, they thought, gave the women so much autonomy that they would never serve as good wives. So most marriages, the overwhelming majority of marriages that the Han took place, took uh, uh, part in, were what are called very local marriages. That is, the man stayed with where he was and the woman moved in. The Aborigines didn't care too much about that. They had quite a bit of Uxura local marriage. Uxura local marriage is the custom where a man moves in to live with the girl's family. On the mainland in China, that is very rare in the rural districts. You very rarely see that happen. Um, and that's part of the uh, ongoing problem of uh, the sex ratio bias uh, and who, look, who is supposed to look after the elderly when they get old. Um, what happened after the foot binding ban, you can see here, this is the fraction of Uxura local marriages among the Aborigines. And you can see that it's quite high. It's, it gets as high in that one village there, one, the one set of Aborigines, as high as 35% of the marriages were Uxura local. This is the fraction of Uxura local marriages. And by 1945, it's below 5%. And it's, it goes down uh, radically. Um, among the Han, there were this one village that had 25%, which dropped down to uh, under 5% by 1945. Um, so that act of uh, making foot binding uh, uh, illegal um, and thereby forcing the women into the fields and the, the motivation behind the Japanese uh, change of that law had to do with their aim of increasing food production and increasing the industrial production of Taiwan. To do that, they would have to build roads and buildings so the men would have to get away from the fields and that would leave nobody to work the fields so the women had to get out of the house to work the fields. And the Japanese exploited the food that was being produced by Taiwan. Almost all of it was exported to Japan. So the consequences of the foot binding ban, which is an institution whose, in whose context all these other things must have occurred, not only led to this radical change in marriage customs, but within about 10 years, the spirit medium, who up until that time had always been a woman in this uh, Aboriginal culture, no longer became a woman, even though in interviews with people uh, um, there's general agreement that the spirit, spiritual leader, or we would call it the shaman, should still be a woman. But 
there was no way that if a, a woman got married that her sisters-in-law would look after any children, which made it impossible for such a thing to happen, for a woman to continue to be a shaman. In addition, you saw uh, changing burial practices that uh, the, the Han people kept their grave sites incredibly clean, swept them and all that sort of thing. You didn't, that, that suddenly took over in the Aboriginal community too. And as well, these ornaments, which were not part of Aboriginal culture, within 10 years became completely normal in the Aboriginal culture. So this abandonment of foot binding had this chain, uh, salutary effect on other cultural aspects. So I would say that that's a good example of foot binding forming a cultural niche in which the other things happened and the removal of it exploded the possibilities for other cultural things to happen. Now, how, how might you go about trying to model this kind of thing? Well, here is the first primitive model of expanding the dimensionality of the number of cultural traits that you look at at once into three, in fact. And uh, the three that we chose to look at are a defining trait, and this is what we would call the focal trait, the one you're really interested in. And another culturally transmitted trait, which affects the selection that might go on this trait, and the selection being Darwinian type selection. So you can think of it either as viability or fecundity or fertility. But in addition, there's been a lot of work in the last five to 10 years on social homophily, homophily being, in, uh, if you're a geneticist, you might have previously thought about it as assortative mating, but it's also assortative meeting. So it's a question of who you associate with. Uh, we'll treat it here uh, in this context as assortative mating, but we've done a great deal of work as well on treating it as assortative meeting after the mating has occurred and children have matured. Uh, the general term for that these days is homophily. So one can think of cultural transmission parameters which operate on the trait itself, on the process that leads to selection, and on the process that decides whether you will or will not mate assortatively. That's also culturally transmitted. For example, the preference to mate with somebody who's of the same religion as you are is certainly not a biological trait. It's a culturally transmitted trait. And the consequences of that culturally transmitted trait uh, could be many other culturally transmitted traits, such as whether you might uh, agree to use contraception or fertility control. So if you were to study both of those together, you have two different cultural traits and they may have what a biologist would call epistasis or interaction between them. And therefore, you would have to include that if you were going to make a dynamical model out of this. So we did that with uh, selection parameters that depended only on the difference between big S and little s, and the assortative mating parameters that only depended on whether you had a big M or a little m. Um, and uh, this is an example of what happens with homophily, where you, uh, this, uh, we chose this guy here, the first part of the mating team, to make the choice. And when that one makes the choice, it's choosing only among those that are having the same T, big T or little t. So the choice is made by your having a big M or a little m, but on the basis of whether you're a big T or a little t. That's the trait on which you're sorting. And this, this is the part of the dynamics, of course. This is just one example of the dynamics. There's a, to, to write it down, you would have to have uh, a couple of pages to write down the full dynamical system. Here's an example of the outcome of uh, iterating that. And this was done numerically because you have very little chance of uh, resolving this uh, eight-dimensional dynamical system uh, ma mathematically. You can prove certain things 
around the boundaries of the simplex that uh, this deterministic eight-dimensional system is operating in, but you're unlikely to be able to say much about the interior. Now, this is an example of what's happening on one four-dimensional boundary where this big S is fixed, so uh, there is no little s in the system. And uh, this it looks like almost a perfect cycle. And it isn't. It's a cycle, but if we're iterating this at the level of 10 to the minus 16, which we were, a lot of these points are not exactly at that 10 to the minus 16 being similar. Some, many times when we see this happening, there are 10 to the minus 5 apart. So it looks like a cycle when you draw it, and it's very difficult to know what it is, whether it's actually a real cycle or not. And it's not part of a bifurcating scheme because we don't see any fixed point that changes into that when you change the parameter. So it's not a standard kind of a cycle, but it happens quite frequently. And you can see that it looks very, very cyclic. But in addition, you have really interesting dynamics, other dynamics. Here is a case where on this boundary of this simplex, you have two possibilities. You've got this point here, which is a fixed point, and all of the starting conditions in the simplex that have red arrows end up there. But if you start where these blue arrows are, then you go into this cycle. So it's a very strange thing that I've never seen in a genetics model. This is an example, the same example, of what happened when you actually went into that fixed point that is, uh, uh, has the, ba the boundary polymorphism. So you have here a stable polymorphism of all eight, and that one looks like this. Here is the, the pink thing here has the polymorphism, and the other thing is a fixed point, which is just a monomorphism. So depending on where you start from, you either got a complete polymorphism or a fixed monomorphism. That sort of thing we have seen in population genetics quite a lot. Um, but this one uh, uh, did not have a cycle in it, and the others did. So you can perturb the parameters slightly and move from having stable fixed points to stable, uh, what appears to be stable cycles, or most of the time, you don't get any of that. You just get fixations of one of these corners. Now, one of the things that happens regularly in these models of uh, cultural transmission, and if I go back and show you this set of numbers here, if this was a one, a half, a half, and zero, that would be symptomatic of pure genetics. And every time you use only pure genetics in the transmission system, you never get any polymorphisms. No matter whether you put recombination between these different traits or not, you never get polymorphisms. And that's a bit of a mystery as to why it is that Mendel's rule applying to these, of course, haploid systems doesn't allow you to get polymorphism, whereas with cultural transmission, you can. Um, the sensitivity of the outcome of a dynamical system with cultural transmission is actually quite striking. This is an example where I have three traits, and for wants of better symbolisms, we call them plus, minus, and star, and they have frequencies U, V, and W. And I write down a mating table between the, the female and the male, or the father and the mother, depending on how you want to uh, call them. And there are these mating types here. They're symmetric. The um, uh, heterogamic matings are considered to be equivalent. And this is the cultural transmission parameters. This is the probability that a mating of plus by plus gives you a minus. It's 0.1. And similarly, two stars, when they mate, give you 0.9 of getting a star. This dynamic has one fixed point, and it's exactly equal to
to Castle's Law, what Sewell Wright called Castle's Law instead of the Hardy-Weinberg Law. Um, he always attributed the Hardy-Weinberg Law to Castle. But Castle did it with P equals a half, and that's what you would end up with um, at P equals a half. But now, if you change these parameters, the transmission parameters, by less than 5%, by a tiny <coughs> amount, then you end up with a model where you have something that doesn't look at all genetic, where all the three frequencies are exactly equal. And that would be, a lot of people would see this in their data and say, oh, that uh, looks very symptomatic of genetics. And of course, it's symptomatic of this kind of cultural transmission, which is close to Mendelian, but not very far from this one, which is giving you this weird outcome of equal frequencies. Now, what we have just been discussing is all about transmission and not saying whether the transmission is due to teaching or learning. Now, many anthropologists have for years denied that active teaching occurs in hunter-gatherer tribes. And the one exception is Barry Hewlett. And he worked closely, has worked closely with Luca cavalli Sforza in his studies of pygmies, and they have some very famous papers on ver uh, vertical cultural transmission of traits in the pygmies in uh, Central African Republic. And uh, he discovered, with his 35 years of working with the forest pygmies, that pedagogy and other forms of teaching exist as early as 12 months of age, but were relatively infrequent by comparison to other processes of social learning. Now, in his last papers, what he's discovered is the difference between how much of this teaching goes on in the hunter-gatherer people and in the farming people that live right next, bar, next door to them and for whom they work and that a lot of the transmission of characters in the pygmies who are um, actually working for the uh, farmers is vertical cultural transmission, but it happens very early. And at the, among the farmers, there's almost no vertical cultural transmission because the parents are out in the fields leaving the children with older brothers and sisters and the older brothers and sisters are sometimes as old as three and four. And their job is to look after the younger ones. So in his recent papers, Barry has discovered this notion that vertical cultural teaching occurs in hunter-gatherers. So um, together with my colleague uh, Kenichi Aoki, of, uh, uh, now he's at Meiji University, uh, spent his career mainly at Tokyo University, and uh, former postdoc Joe Wakano, who's now also at Meiji University, we decided to look at the consequences of uh, teaching. And we will call it altruistic teaching because the idea behind it is it costs the teacher something in terms of time or energy that could otherwise be fruitfully used for product production of something, and we call that altruistic teaching. Now, you can argue with the term altruistic, but um, we call it that because commonly in the biological literature, if it costs you something to do it, that is going to benefit another person, whether it is your child or an unrelated individual, it is given the name altruism. And the first model that I'm going to show is a model of uh, asexual transmission. And there's going to be a gene which, which is a dichotomy between teaching and not teaching. And there's going to be a trait, which is the trait which you learn, which is transmitted. And we'll call it bar and not bar. And uh, the teachers can transmit that at that rate alpha. And the non-teachers transmit it at a lower rate. And the difference between the bar and the not bar is where the fitness is happening. So what's going on here is this is almost like a two locus trait, except it's not. One is a gene and one is a culturally transmitted trait. And 
there are four phenogenotypes, and we can write them as with the gene and the bar or not bar on top. And then we can ask, what happens to the evolution of those frequencies of these uh, variables? Now, after vertical transmission, the cost to the uh, teacher is this delta, and these are the transmission rates. So this is after vertical transmission at the cost of teaching. Then one postulates that there is a neural structure that has to be developed in the child before the child can learn, and that has a cost, gamma. But when it learns it, there's an advantage, a, a gain in fitness to that child, which is S. So you have to uh, confound those two, combine those two, to end up with a, a recursion whose normalizer is this quantity here. But because of this linear nature and this linear nature, the whole dynamic is linear fractional. So it's a very easy analysis. And one can uh, just give the uh, answers in terms of the eigenvalues of this uh, triangular matrix here. And it'll tell you where the system is going to end up. And you can show either you end up without any teachers and without any bar phenotype, or you end up with no teachers, but both of the phenotypes, or only teachers and both of the phenotypes. So they're the only possibilities that can happen. And the nice thing about working with haploids that don't mate with one another is that this dynamic is absolutely complete. You don't have to worry about uh, cycles or anything. So this uh, linear fractional is characteristic of asexual transmission. Now, if you put in the possibility that there can be mating between these uh, two different phenogenotype sets, and these are the transmission parameters within each of these matings, and we then make a, a simplifying assumption on the relationships between the transmission parameters if you have two parents with a bar or one parent with a bar. So we make this one equal to twice that and similar transmission uh, uh, assumptions. The very special idea here, just to make the transmission additive, you end up with the following class of dynamics. Now the upper pictures are going to be the relationship between alpha and beta. And in here, it tells you what kind of fixed points are possible. So to remind you of the coloring, there's the coloring here. So if you end up in a purple place, then you don't have any teachers and no bar. If you end up in a blue place, you have no teachers, but you have bar and not bar. And if you end up with light green, you only have teachers. But then there are areas of overlap where in gray, you can have both as possibilities, or in dark green, you can have both as possibilities. So that's why we decided to use this color representation as the uh, description of the dynamics. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Let's get back to the picture. So this is the case of sex, ma uh, of mating, and this is the case of the linear fractional transformation. And you can see that there is no overlap of any of the possible outcomes. Here is an, an overlap of the outcome where you can have both complete absence of both teaching and uh, the, the phenotypic polymorphism, and you can have fixation on teachers. You, this is only possible in the, in the case with mating, where you actually have a mating going on. You can't have it in the asexual transmission. Now, we change the parameters slightly, 
this is a, a parameter, one parameter change, and a new thing happens. We have a white strip here, which only happens when you have sexual reproduction, and that's a polymorphism where you have all four types present. You still have the other things going on, but in here you have all four types present. There's a tiny little thing there that's very difficult to see where there's an overlap. And in this case, you actually do see the dark green. In that place, you've got a situation of bistability, but bistability on two edges, where either the teachers are fixed and you've got both phenotypes, or the non-teachers are fixed and you've got both phenotypes, and here is where you have a full polymorphism. So this is a very limited parameter set that we're dealing with, yet you have really interesting dynamics. You, you always get this kind of uh, bi-stability in the grey there, never in this uh, case where you don't have uh, um, sexual reproduction. And this is a bit, very large area of polymorphism. So the take-home message from this is that if you put in sexual reproduction with vertical cultural transmission, the possibilities for polymorphism, for multi-stability, bi-stability, in this four-dimensional case, become quite large. And if you only have asexual transmission, then there's qualitatively not much dependence on the parameters. You just have these three areas. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is a finite population example, and this is an example that will uh, resonate with people who are doing uh, genomics because it's based on the infinitely many sites model of population genetics. Um, in one of their most well-known papers, these Lysett and Gowlett uh, discussed the possible rates of transmission um, in terms of the modes of transmission, these were taken from uh, the book I did with Luca Cavalli Sforza, and their uh, conclusion as to who the transmitter would be, who the learner would be, how likely it is that the, the trait would be accepted, and then finally the rate of cultural evolution under these different modes of transmission. So, actually, it was this paper that led uh, Aoki and Wakano and uh, Laurel Fogarty, my current postdoc, to do a kind of simulation, an agent-based simulation of the infinitely many sites model. Um, and I'll tell you more details about the comparison between doing an analytical model of the infinitely many sites model and an agent-based simulation of the infinitely many sites model, which can't be infinitely many sites. So um, in the analytical model, we assume that there are infinitely many sites. Mutations only occur at monomorphic sites. Mutation occurs in newborns. In the simulation, we assumed that the innovation, which is the analog to mutation, occurred in adults. All the traits are neutral, so there is no selection in this. However, the big difference is in our simulation, there's only a finite number of sites that are subject to the mutation, and sometimes we inadvertently call it the infinitely many sites model because the kind of assumption on those finite sites is exactly the assumption that is made in the infinitely many sites model of DNA uh, evolution. Our parameters are natural parameters, the population size, and we introduce this K, which is the number of acquaintances that you meet that will be involved in the cultural transmission process. This is the mutation rate or innovation rate, and here is whether these traits are going to be learned perfectly. If beta is one, then it's the, you don't need to have any th thoughts about cultural transmission other than the people or individuals to whom the transmission is occurring. And finally, 
this is the number of traits we're going to deal with. M, we call it the imagination space, and that is the length of the vector that would normally be all of the DNA bases, but it's not going to be that big. So you have N individuals, and at each time step, one individual is born. The newborn acquires a variant of each trait from older individuals by social learning, and then one of the random older individuals is chosen to die. And this is exactly the Moran model of reproduction in a cultural context. A uh, very famous model, widely used in population genetics. So the life expectancy of that newborn is actually n time steps in the scale of the births and deaths that occur in the Moran model. So this is a classical picture of the uh, rate of evolution. A mutation or innovation occurs, and most of the time it'll disappear by drift, and occasionally it'll go to fixation. And the average uh, rate is this uh, one over this space between, in time between those uh, fixation states. And that's the analogue of the rate of cultural evolution that we're going to use. And uh, this is due to uh, Kimura, that the rate of evolution is the population size times the mutation rate times uh, the probability that a mutation arising once in the population fixes. There's a classical formula from Kimura. So we can look at it in a very simplistic way, put time this way and frequency this way. And the mutations are going along up there. This is where fixation occurs. And we'll, in this particular case, three fixations occurred. And the time between successive fixations was T1, T2, and T3. And the R is the total number of uh, fixations in the denominator and the um, uh, time total on the top. So you take this, invert it, and you get the classical rate of fixation. Now, here's a trivial example where the imagination space is four. Every individual is defined as a four vector in this uh, agent-based simulation. This particular one at trait one has a zero. We're only going to deal with dichotomous traits that are only going to be zeros and ones. So each individual might innovate. They're only going to mon innovate in the beginning at monomorphic sites. Later, we'll allow recurrent mutation to happen, and that will change the way in which the evolution occurs, because in the infinitely many sites model, this doesn't, is not allowed. So, there's a particular population, five individuals, each with their own uh, vector of cultural traits, and we're going to do different modes of learning. There are four main ones that we consider. Random oblique learning is completely analogous to the Watterson model of transmission of just one mutation and you copy that individual and go on into the next generation and then a random individual dies. This is completely analogous to the classical Moran model. These are not. These are totally different. This one, two individuals or K individuals are chosen and you look at some properties of those individuals and copy those before you make it into the next generation and a random individual is killed. That's a, a variant of the Moran model with cultural transmission based on your learning from K individuals. Success bias is where you copy all of the individuals, you've got a one, you copy the ones into those positions in you and you go into the next generation. And the one-to-many transmission is where one individual is chosen and that individual is regarded as a teacher for all the other individuals and its traits are transmitted to all the other sampled individuals until it dies. 
and then another individual is randomly chosen to be the teacher. So these variants of the Moran model all are expected to produce different results, and they do. So here's the random oblique model going into action. The newborn is always all zeros. This particular one is going to uh, copy this guy and becomes this, and this individual is chosen to die and is replaced by that individual. So that's the Moran model uh, as Watterson would have done it. Um, this is the success bias model. You copy the individual with the most ones. So this is the newborn. This guy has three ones. It, we're only, he randomly cho chose. He could have chosen this one too because that one's got three ones. And he cho uh, we randomly chose those three individuals to be the ones among whom he's going to copy. So he will copy this individual. And in the best of K model, you choose ones from K individuals here and you copy the ones from those positions that have ones. So this particular individual has a one here and a one here. And if you go through it, you can change the classical Moran dy dynamics, the Markov chain, which describes the transitions from one time step to another. And then you do n of those time steps to get a complete generation. And this is the probability that you adopt one, the probability of adopting zero. This is the death probability and the birth probability. This is the classical thing that is in uh, textbooks on uh, population genetics. So this, this Markov chain describes what's going on in the random oblique model. And you can do analogous things for all of the models except the success bias model. We haven't figured out how you would write out the mathematics for that. So in the best of K, for example, this tells you what the fixation probability is if you start from uh, one individual then you've got to compute things that go through this Markov chain. You end up with uh, fixation probabilities, which are classical. These things are now part of the um, corpus of population genetic theory. The difference is that it's best of K, so everything depends on K and population genetic theory. You don't have that K there. And this is the difference in the cultural evolutionary rate. And it depends very much on K. When you shift from having copied one individual or copied two individual, you have a big shift in the cultural evolutionary rate. Um, this is a bit unexpected. And what's unexpected about it is that when you go up from two to three, you don't get such a change in the cultural evolutionary rate. And it gets even smaller as you increase the number of individuals that you copy. It's a very big step from one to two and not from then on. Um, that we, don't, we don't fully understand why that is yet, but it's a fact that these are the analytical results for the infinitely many sites model with a population size uh, going up to 250. And uh, um, you can ask, do the simulations agree with the analytical model, remembering that the simulations don't have infinitely many sites. So let's take 170 long vector for each individual and uh, we'll iterate for 1500 generations and there'll be one mutation per individual per generation. And uh, these are the simulation results with a small population size going up to 25 and we put these three models in this picture and the best of K in this picture. These are the simulation, these are the exact analytical results, the ones with circles. And we don't have results that are sim uh, analytical for this. So what we see is the analytical and simulation results for 170 traits are identical uh, for a population size up to 25. Now, Watterson in 1975 uh, 
presented with a beautiful paper on the expected number of segregating sites in the population and the variance in the number of segregating sites in the population. And so we decided to see how well with the infinitely many sites model, the statistics given by Watterson match the statistics given by us. And uh, in this particular uh, example, for instance, there are three traits in the population. All of these are not considered as uh, traits yet until they've been innovated. So when there's a learning probability that's better less than one, then the number of segregating traits or the number of traits is exactly the same thing. You, you don't have to worry about that difference. This is the comparison between the results of Watterson 1975 for infinitely many sites using exactly the same mutation rate, exactly the same population size, and this is our simulation results with uh, 500 simulations a 200 length vector of sites and the random oblique model. And you can see that we're very close. That with 200 sites, we're almost at the infinitely many sites model. Um, so the take home message here is that with about 200 sites or an agent based simulation with these kinds of cultural transmission systems is com completely, uh, do it first, doable, but second, that uh, the results are likely to be very informative in comparison to the uh, standard model. And the standard model would be the random oblique model. And against that model, which is the same as Watterson's model, we can make all our comparisons. And that's what the project is that we're working on now, is to actually go through and make those comparisons to see just exactly how sensitive it is to the uh, number of traits in the vector of traits, to the population size, to whether you learn with that parameter better or not. And uh, it's actually turning out to be a very rich class of agent-based simulations. Thank you. Yeah, just one minute. I want to put up who the collaborators are. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to talk about a very concrete example of the Taiwan of the Asian Gator talk, and then you sort of really went into the models later on. Yeah. And then I just wanted to hear some sort of example of going back to a sort of concrete example and seeing. Um, I understand that a lot of the models are very idealized, but I wonder if you've thought about how, what they might say in a more concrete situation. Yeah, well, there's been a couple that we've uh, published uh, relatively recently, and one of them has, has to do with uh, the context of education, and we divided education into uh, educated and uneducated as one of the traits, and the other trait was attitudes toward, this is females, the attitudes towards uh, fertility control. So if the first is like an institution, uh, the second is a trait that you're going to keep track of. And the transmission of the attitudes towards fertility control depend on the level of education of the individual you're dealing with and the frequency of that level of education in the population. So we ap applied that one. Uh, the example I gave of religion and uh, attitudes towards contraception is also another example that was in the paper we had in uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society. So uh, we'll, we keep looking for examples like that where there is a, a good enough basis for assuming that there is some kind of a cultural niche that is uh, defining what will be the transmission rates of some other cultural trait that you're interested in. And there are not that much data out there, and that's because anthropologists don't think in terms of collecting data in that form. And it would be a big help if they did. Yeah? So when would be a way to test for independence of the traits? So, because many of these things... 
Yeah. Okay. How would we do it if we were geneticists? Um, we'd actually compute linkage disequilibrium, and that's what we do here too. It, when in the multi-dimensional traits, we keep track of all of the statistical associations between the different traits, and that is some evidence for uh, association in transmission. But it could be association in fitness. It could be association in homophily as well. So um, got to be a bit careful, but we do keep track of the disequilibrium. Yeah, Mark, Chuck. The last thing that you talked about with all the sort of the... The Moran model. The, 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 the relationship with the sort of classic infinite size. Yeah. I'm just wondering what traits are the sort of the first ones that come to mind. On me, I'm sitting there thinking of, of vocabulary. Ah. But you didn't mention any particular traits, so I wonder if it's sort of... We didn't. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, things that we're actually working on heavily now is the presence and absence of phonemes in uh, a language. So it's not looking in that case at individuals within a, a group. It's looking at the evolution of the language as a whole. And so we have a database, which can, the two databases. One of them consists of 700 uh, phonemes, presence or absence, and 3,000 languages. And we're in the process of trying to simulate the geography of that process to see whether it matches what we know about the uh, serial founder effect in genes out of Africa. The data that we have on that seems to be weakly in agreement with the serial founder effect, that there's a slight regression uh, that uh, shows a decrease in variability from Africa to the Americas, um, but it's not nearly as strong as Atkinson proposed. Uh, he was using uh, about a, a third of the number of phonemes, didn't have as many languages, and the statistics that he did are a little uh, uh, strange. Um, it turns out that the main determinant of these of the, that phonemic variability is whether you include clicks or not. And uh, the South, South African um, variety of clicks turns out to determine where the best origin for, uh, in the world for phonemic variation mm -hmm. is. If you leave phonemes out, all together that have clicks in them, the best origin is in Europe, which is really weird. But there are so many clicks in the uh, southern part of Africa that it makes a, makes a very big difference. So that, that's uh, one of the uh, best examples that we're dealing with at the moment. Can I, can I follow up on this? Absolutely. That analysis, are you finding evidence because in the, the theoretical analysis, mutation is a I was just wondering, in the analysis of phonemes, do you see mutation? Is there clear evidence of mutation in the history there's, of there's an, languages? We, you can't uh, estimate the rate in the uh, languages. Uh, it's easier to do it with cognates than it is with phonemes. Um, but what we do see is an effect of this best of K, that um, those languages that have the most... Uh, neighbors that have different phonemic uh, ranges from themselves are the ones that uh, change the fastest. So there's a kind of a uh, neighborhood effect uh, that, we, that hasn't been identified in the literature before. 